Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. All anybody here is thinking about is how do we make the project the best thing it can be? That's what everyone's thinking about. You do you, and part of you should be solving the how do I help make this the best project possible? Ali White. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Hi, Jack. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good. Uh, I understand you're in a closet in Brooklyn. I am. I am in a closet, in a larger, slightly larger closet that serves as my daughter's room in our Brooklyn apartment, <laughs> yes. just, you know, weathering away the quarantine as Indeed. one does. Yeah. We're living in this strange new normal. Listeners, the voice you just heard in our intro snippet was that of Keegan Michael Key. And um, among the many things that Keegan and I spoke about in today's uh, interview, we did discuss life in quarantine. Just a note for listeners this interview was recorded pretty soon after lockdown, like at this point, a couple months ago. I don't know. Is, what is time? Time is passing strangely, right? It's a flat circle, according to uh, <sighs> someone. So, yeah, what is that from? Something. True, de- True Detective? True Detective. Yes, that is so funny. Um, which Keegan Michael Key is not involved in, but. No. Um, <laughs> no, he's not. But, Allie, you're here today. I asked you here today because, first of all, we're both fans of Keegan Michael Key. And I'm assuming most listeners kind of know who he is, and most listeners who are tuning into this episode know who he is. But you interviewed him for his cover story in 2017. What do you remember about that interview? I just remember him being one of the nicest people I'd ever met. Um, The story was for his Netflix show, Friends from College, but Mm -hmm. in conjunction with the premiere of that, he was doing um, Hamlet at the Public here in New York, and it was a with Oscar Isaac, Mm. and it was, I think, the first time in his, like, quote, professional career as a famous person that he had done... Shakespeare Hmm. or even a dramatic role, which is actually what he was trained for. He's a classically trained actor. Um, and he sort of fell into comedy in this crazy way. And at the time he was trying to move away a bit from comedy and Mm -hmm. focus more on his, you know, serious side of things. Um, but yeah, I remember I had seen the show with, um, like a rep from his, his manager's office the night before the interview and had told this woman that my (laughs) husband was a big fan because Keegan Michael Mm. Key did his graduate work at Penn State and that's where my husband went. So when I got to the interview, he (laughs) was decked out in Penn State clothing. Um, Oh my God. And I said something Because you had said that? Yeah. So she had passed on the note, I guess like the anecdote and he- whipped out every piece of Penn State clothing he owned (laughs) and answered the door, you know, and head to toe athletic gear. And no, he was just like a a really lovely human, very funny, smart, um, had really interesting things to say about his career and, and advice and sort of the balance between comedic and dramatic acting. And if there needs to be, and, um, I mean, his career has continued to go on since then. Yeah, totally. Cause it is, it's the dramatic theater training he's had, but he also, he worked at second city. He has sketch and improv. Um, he's got writing experience, of course, on key and peel that's sketch writing and sketch performing. So yeah, he, he comes from a lot of different walks of life. We mm-hmm. talked about his, um, 
recent Broadway production too. That is so funny that he came decked out in all of that because he had been told this random detail. Like that says so much about who he is that he goes above and beyond to be like, first of all, very nice, but also like committing to a bit. Yes. And I, I remember thinking to myself, do I like, do I blow my cool and say something to him (laughs) or is this just a coincidence? And of course I have zero chill. So I said something and he was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so-and-so told me, um, I thought it would be like a fun icebreaker and he was right. And it was. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, so listeners can check out your 2017 cover story and, uh, compare and contrast with this podcast interview with Keegan. And um, what's going on over at Backstage.com these days? We've been getting into the behind the scenes scene a little bit in terms of, you know, we've always been a publication for and about actors and the craft of acting and performing. And we have realized that there are people in this industry who want to be involved in productions that don't want to be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. So we have really been pushing to educate ourselves and in turn our readers about what the behind the scenes stuff looks like. The people who make the stuff that you're watching on screen or whatever kind of screen you're choosing to watch on, Um, you know, the below the line people, the creatives, everyone from production assistants to grips to, you know, line producers to cinematographers. So it's been a real education in how things get made and are just always fascinating. Yes. Super fascinating to learn. I kind of hate this phrase, but for lack of a better term, how the sausage actually gets made. Um, we now have a whole crew and creator offering on the site. If anyone out there is interested in, you know, becoming a member of a production crew or trying to learn how to get started or even what your options are. So many people that we've talked to who are now at the top of their game have said, wow, I really wish something like this existed when I was starting out because I didn't know that my, what I'm doing now was an option. And I had to go through so many jobs and so many years of trial and error to even get to the point where I knew this was a thing. So our hope is really to maybe help people skip, skip a few steps. Absolutely. That's yeah. It sounds cheesy, but that's very much like what backstage is all about, like educating and providing the resources and inspiring other people to pursue any, any avenue in the entertainment industry. Exactly. So if you're a crew member looking for Mm -hmm. a job, you know, backstage could be your, your next resource. Totally. And that goes for quarantine era and beyond. Yes. Well, hopefully, hopefully well beyond. (laughs) Indeed. We'll, we'll see. And um, on that note, on that <laughs> ominous note. <laughs> well, listen, during my interview with Keegan-Michael Key, he did say uh-huh. he was done with comedy and <laughs> Hamlet is nothing if not ominous. So it's a, this is a full circle moment in Very our recording. <laughs> totally. And um, the other thing we didn't mention was that his current project is called Brain Games on National Geographic, where he is the host. And that is that is also not darkly dramatic. That's like a fun, goofy, and also educational program. And just a side note, we're so thrilled to have National Geographic and Brain Games sponsoring today's episode. Yay. So um, thank you, Ali, for helping me introduce this episode. And we are going to hear a quick word from our sponsor and then get to it. In its exciting new season, the Emmy-nominated National Geographic series Brain Games merges brain power with star power as celebrities perform challenges that reveal the science behind what makes us tick. Host Keegan-Michael Key leads willing victims from Anthony Anderson to Kristen Bell to Mark Cuban through fun and highly entertaining interactive games, illusions, and social experiments to help them realize their untapped brain potential. It's the perfect television series for the whole family. Brain Games is for your Emmy consideration for outstanding hosted nonfiction series or special and all other eligible categories. For more information, visit natgeotv.com slash FYC.
Actor of stage and screen and improv and sketch comedy genius Keegan-Michael Key is best known for his work on Mad TV and opposite Jordan Peele on their Emmy-winning Key and Peele, but has also starred on Playing House, Fargo, Friends from College, in feature films Keanu, The Predator, Dolomite Is My Name, and countless voiceover roles. He now hosts Brain Games, National Geographic's science and celebrity game show. Here he is, the brilliant Keegan-Michael Key. Keegan, hello. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. I'm so good, except for, you know, we're all figuring this out. The, yeah, other than a, a global pandemic, no big deal. Um, it really seems like there's <laughs> something going around. I don't know. I, that's what I've heard. I don't know. I just voluntarily have been locked in my house for uh, seven weeks. So. <laughs> it's just no my news. Brain. <laughs> you don't know what's happening. No, I've just yeah. done a complete a complete media detox. Now, um, yeah, this is, yeah, if only, if only. If only, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm on a bit of a media detox for, for self-care purposes. I mean, I'm... I don't know. This is a new normal, and I don't know if we're ever going to get a an old normal back. I don't. I I, I don't think so. I think I agree. Or I, it's not that you posited that. You just were saying positing it as a question. I think it's certainly <laughs> possible that that there will be a new normal. I think that subconsciously we're going to find ourselves. Uh, how shall I say it? Uh, subconsciously, we're gonna we're gonna find ourselves um, exhibiting new behaviors. You know what's what's strange mm-hmm. about the pandemic is, especially in this country, is it's foisted culture on us in a really oh, fast, mm-hmm. significant way. So I think about people like South Americans, Argentinians, are people who are um, who keep very close proximity to each other culturally, mm-hmm. and I wonder how that's going to change for a person who's Argentinian or a person who's Peruvian. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? Whereas we, I mean, and then there's other countries in the world where the people keep a lot of distance. And so it, it's going to be interesting because you, I think you end up getting culture foisted upon you by a significant event that affects everyone. It's really interesting. Totally. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'm no anthropologist, but that's the theory. <laughs> it sounds like you are. I mean, it's, it's this big global experiment that's mm-hmm. not a voluntary experiment. It's just we all are participating in this thing. I mean, someone was saying that there's never been more of a collective human effort to try to solve one problem. Right, exactly. Which is sort of cool to think about. I don't know. I think so. I think so. Yeah, it is. I think you're right. It's, um, this is, uh, (laughs) to take it to entertainment, this is that moment, right? This is that moment in Independence Day when the spaceship is over the White House. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or all of the halls of power in the world. And it's funny, I, I would not be surprised if we start seeing more films. And, and this will happen, like, this is my theory. In two to three years, mm-hmm. a bunch of movies will come out where there will be a lot that will be thick with allegory. Uh, yes. th- that I think that will be very similar t- to uh, Independence Day or the day the Earth stood still. You know what the cold, what the day the Earth stood still was to the Cold War. Uh, the pan, this pandemic, uh, yeah, artists yeah. Will find ways to personalize the pandemic. Even in small, I think even in small intimate films, it'll be a mm-hmm. person who's looming over us or uh, a corporation. Something will be the yeah. stand-in for this, um, this, this, this kind of ubiquitous event that's taking place yeah yeah like some kind of metaphorical or even if it's in some other completely different genre it's still yeah. represented as like this thing yeah and, and and it's interesting right so now when if you think about so 2000 oh, oh, God, this is why i'm an actor i don't do math what's 2008 how many years ago is that 2000 uh, 12? 2010, 12 years ago so 12 years ago right there's children there are 12 year old children in this world there are nine year old children in this world there are children in this world who only know obama and trump as presidents right right and if hillary had been elected they would have only known obama and hillary they would only know a black man mm-hmm. and a woman as president mm-hmm. so it's interesting what how what their worldview will be or what a 19 year old yeah. or 23 year old's worldview is now Based, and there are babies being born now that will be that'll come out of a NICU, and that baby will live in its house. And I'm not sure how that affects the baby, but the baby will live in its house for, hmm. as of right now. I know we're saying May 15th, but I really feel like we're dealing with a moving target here. Hmm. That that it's going to end up being an interesting thing where where babies will be living indefinitely in their home, 
with their family. So weird. You yeah. know, it's so strange. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really, it's, I, I, I don't mean this to be dispassionate, but it's fascinating. Yeah. Or maybe it, like I'm finding it's like, it's fascinating on a good day. <laughs> and then on a bad day. <laughs> on a good day. Like, I also, uh, I also feel like the government, not the government at large, but just kind of, the, um, because we don't enjoy crisis, it's uncomfortable for us. I feel like the country right now, our country is being run the same way a line at the airport is run when the oh, flight's been, yeah. you know, they keep telling us, ladies and gentlemen, it'll be 35 minutes. Uh, we have found the plan. They are in route. Yes. Uh, now they're the land. The crew's going to have to do some cleaning. Now they know Jack good and well, it's going to be 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this virus doesn't really abide by those kinds of it, it rules not. and structures. So a, yeah. yeah, exactly. There's at least math with travel. The plane is going 500 miles per hour with a tailwind. <laughs> like, there's at least some aerodynamic math you can use. This is a totally different situation. So it really is. It really is. And you mentioned that. I mean, I'm so fascinated by, again, fascinated on a good day. But like the, the, this effect on the entertainment industry. Mm. I think the industry itself, but also just yeah, the, the creativity and the stories that we will tell. I'm finding it so interesting that oh, dystopian literature, dystopian stories are sort of my frame of reference for this new life. Like, it is not normal to me to see everybody in masks. Yes, and Apparently exactly. that's going to be our new thing. And so in my mind, I just go to, I don't know, Ray Bradbury or go to, like, all of these um, sick, apocalyptic fictions. <laughs> exactly, right. And that's our only way of understanding this thing is through entertainment. Oh, that's a really interesting, yes, that's a very good frame to put it around. You're right. It's only through entertainment. that, And hasn't that always been the future? If you think way back sure. to, to uh, it's it's us coming head on with the future in a very, as I said before, ubiquitous way, as opposed to, I'm sure everybody kind of looked at Dick Tracy and said, mm. oh, look, he's got a TV uh, on his watch. But I love how art always precedes the next imaginative frontier. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, sometimes I mean, some people, some people are are extremely excited, and some people smirk. But mm-hmm. Bezos and and Elon Musk, they're gonna go to Mars. Now, maybe totally. it doesn't happen in this lifetime, but we're going to Mars. It's it's going to happen. <laughs> you, you know, and, and I think that the more that um, I, just, I I do the same thing. I try to read futurist literature sometimes. Yeah, and see how it fadges with um with science right. fiction literature from even like you said ray bradbury even from the late 40s or 50s totally yeah george orwell like any of this oh, just like yeah as of off yeah, interesting yeah. interesting yeah yeah so Look that's at our why conversation it's, very eddy to so be to intellectual yeah. i mean goodness i i never know where these conversations are going to go but that's especially true in this time of pandemic when we're mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. connecting in any number of ways with any number of technical difficulties by the way if i if i crap out if my connection craps out at any moment i apologize we will reconnect but okay. we're all just you know we're, we're making it up as we go and exactly yeah um i know you're i want to ask you all about your kind of theatery background mm-hmm. but are you going to like do more theater i know you're you're in this movie musical also coming up yes yes i am yeah <laughs> I, I i two movie musicals actually this year uh-huh. two better, well are scheduled to be released this year we'll see how it all work how it all pans out but um the plan is to do something. I keep putting. I, I keep doing the same thing our government's doing with the pandemic. I keep putting a date on it, like 2022, and then all of a sudden sure. this, this happened. I'm like, okay, so 2023, fall yeah. 2023 through the winter, I'll do something. But um, I, I had a very. It was 2017, and it was a very good year to be able to have the opportunity to both um, do a show during the summer and do a show during the winter. So I did a show at the Public off Broadway. Mm-hmm. I did a, a production of Hamlet with Oscar Isaac and Sam Gold. Mm-hmm. And uh, which was life changing. It was just absolutely uh, I bet. A, 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 a seismic experience for me. And then that year, later that year, I did a, a comedy, a Steve Martin comedy with Amy Schumer and um, and Jeremy Seamus and Laura Benanti. And it was lovely, just a lovely, amazing, nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I have every intention of returning back to the stage. Ah, yeah, it is. It, good to it hear. is. I'm one of those guys. I'm one of those people. I, I know everybody says it. If you're a theater person, it's just you can't you don't want to escape from it. And in fact, <laughs> making that movie, I wrapped in the movie and then the movie had to stop prematurely because of the oh, okay. pandemic. But it, it, Meryl Streep's in the movie. And I was asking Meryl Streep, I said, 
I said, or you can, oops, hold on, hold on. I just dropped that name. I just picked that up. I was going to say, that was a really big name. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I want to see her to do theater again so badly. You know what I mean? I just kept, I'm like, he can stop, leave Meryl, (sighs) stop asking her when she's going to do theater. And she said, she just said she didn't know. She didn't know. She Uh she said, it has to kind of be just exactly the right thing. So, well, as her biggest fan, I really appreciate that, like, report from the front lines of getting Meryl to do theater again. Because... <laughs> I'm trying, Jack. I'm here. I'm pushing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. So, yeah, if you studied theater in college, I mean, was comedy also, was comedy, like, what was the goal? Or I guess even going back further, like, what, did you get bit by the acting bug? I did in high school. I got bit mm-hmm. by the acting bug. Actually, that's not true. I got bit by the acting bug in probably 1980. I remember, you know what? Gosh, I think I'm just discovering this right now as I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know what got me? In grade school, when I saw a production of Godspell in my uh-huh. grade school, my heart soared. Mm. And there, uh, there was, I was young, I was a little kid, but I had a crush on this girl. Her name, Lisa, Lisa Santangelo. Okay. Lisa Santangelo, was that her name? Anyway, she was in Godspell. And I, you know, I was a little kid, but she that girl made my heart kind of go pitter-patter. But the interesting thing was also the magic of the theater, of just watching the kids on stage mm-hmm. and realizing that was a thing you could do. And it was somehow different than the chorus stuff that we did. You know, when you when you stand up in rows. I'm oh, sure. in your fifth grade class and you sing a song. The teacher has the whole class sing a song. Mm. I, I, I saw how this was somehow markedly different than that. Gotcha. And it was magical. And that combined with the Muppet show, Jim Henson's, oh. Muppet, which was a theatrical variety show that yeah. you were watching on TV and watching kind of all the backstage machinations. And uh, that was really <laughs> It was really so fascinating to me. And then I started watching award shows. And I remember okay. I thought to myself, I'm going to figure out who these people are. Like, I hear my father say something <laughs> about, wow, Raquel Welch. And I'm like, who's Raquel Welch? And uh-huh. why, does, why do all the adults in this room know who this person is? Right. And then there was Raquel Welch on the, on the Muppet Show. And then, the, you know, somebody uh-huh. would use a comparison or they'd say, oh, just like, um, oh, he was big, just like Orson Welles. And I'm like, who are these people that they're talking uh-huh. about? Yeah, and yeah. First celebrity, I think I learned their name was Frank Sinatra. I said, I know who Fra- I know who that guy is, and that guy is a guy who sings and he's in movies. Mm-hmm. I've never seen any of the movies. And then I said, I'm going to start trying to learn who all these people were. Cool. And my, the gateway drug was the Muppet Show. The school, Amazing. the school plays in the Muppet Show, and it came full circle to my junior year in college when I played Jesus in Godspell. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I was at this, I was on this tack where I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then I guess I realized that that required math. And so <laughs> I was like, the hell am I doing? And um, so I got to play Jesus and Godspell. And then by the time I got to college, I, there was just not even a choice. That was it. I was majoring in theater and that was it. Wow. So you really are the theater kid. I am the theater kid. Oh, through and through. (laughs) I was a drama kid, theater kid. I I was, I I just, (laughs) I was telling somebody the other day a story about how, when I was in high school, oh God, I mean, I embraced it wholeheartedly, Jack, the, the, (laughs) the whole, all the artsy fartsy stuff I could do is what really, I relished it. I relished it. I was not a dilettante. I relished it. And, and I would go to the movies on the weekends with my friends and (laughs) It's so funny. It's I'd come into the school during the um, during the week, and everybody else had gone to see Dirty Dancing, and I had gone to see my beautiful laundrette, or the <laughs> you know, or prick up your ears, or or gotcha. Blair of White Worm. You know, that was my thing, and and uh, those were the people that I hung out with. Those were the people that I thought were cool, and those were the people that resonated with me. Right. See, we always love asking about the earliest influences, and I love that maybe it all comes back to the Muppet Show. The Muppet Show, isn't that something else? Yeah, See, and which has all those stars on it. Which exactly. Is kind of informative, exactly. yeah. And then at some point it must have been like, so how did comedy enter its way into the picture? Was that after college? No, no. I In college, I joined a, uh, there was a guy who was in my fraternity, I was in a fraternity, and uh, there was a guy in my fraternity who had who had auditioned for the national touring company for the Second City Improv Theater in Chicago. And he came back home to Detroit and he started to um, he started a, an improv troupe. Mm-hmm. 
And I auditioned okay. for the improv group and it, it, it appeared that I had a facility for this work and I really certainly enjoyed it. And, 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 um, that was kind of my introduction to performing comedy. Otherwise I always just relied on the writing of a playwright, you know, and sometimes I would say gotcha. I, I was in a production of two by two and uh, that Danny Kay had done on Broadway. And I remember I had a joke that I didn't get. And it was fascinating that you would tell that you would open your mouth, utter a line and the oh. audience went insane. And I had no idea why it was funny. Oh, I had no weird. idea why the joke was funny. Huh. And that was some, that was one thing that kind of hooked me and made me go now what? So what's the, what's the framework of why this is funny? What's the anatomy of why it's funny? But uh, I would say even then, I, I think the probably the, the origins of that would be Saturday morning cartoons. My father would watch the Bugs Bunny Hour. Bugs Bunny. The Bugs Bunny. Uh, the, the, so the Warner Brothers cartoons, right? Totally. And the Looney, the Looney Tunes. And my I, my father, grown man, would just laugh uproariously <laughs> at the Roadrunner and the Coyote. He just yeah. thought that was the funniest thing. And I, I worshipped him. So I thought, you know, you're a child, so your parents mm-hmm. are kind of are godlike to you. So I'm like, this 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 material on the television is disarming my father. That's powerful. Why yeah. is it so powerful? And so that was my first, I think that would be the, the burgeoning, how should you say, the embryonic beginnings of, of, of what the power of comedy was. I didn't know that I was going to be a student of it. But it was, mm-hmm. I, I took my dad as the cue. He liked SNL. He liked Eddie Murphy. He mm. liked uh, he he liked Saturday morning cartoons. That was kind of what was moving me wow. in that direction, right? That and the and the the passion for theater sort of combined it, to exactly. Set you on this path. Exactly. So the Second City ended up being a very a perfect fit. So mm. I ended up ultimately working at the Second City. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I left college and gra- I went to graduate school. When I finished graduate school, I thought for a hundred percent I was going to go. Uh, at that time, that was the late nineties. So at that time, one of the big theater scenes in the country was Seattle. And I was thinking about mm. Seattle with a couple of uh, classmates and trying to stake our claim there and do regional theater there. And I thought my career held for me a wonderful life of doing Shakespeare festivals and traveling around and doing regional theater and just scraping by and being gloriously happy as an artist. <laughs> and then um, when I got out of graduate school, I went back home to Detroit and I started a theater with about eight friends of mine. Okay. Yeah. And we started a theater called the planet ant and it's a theater that incubates talent and teaches improv classes and also writes plays and, uh, uh, and creates pieces of work that derive from improvisation as well as getting the rights for legit plays and just, and, oh, okay. yeah. and it's, and I'm proud to say it's still running today. And this theater uh, in Detroit, a small black box theater can fit about 75 to 80 people. Amazing. And there's a little community around it. And I'm very, very proud of it. And, and uh, that it is a, a benchmark or a touchstone of this, uh, this uh, part of the community in Detroit. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that. And then, and then I got cast in the second city in Detroit. Mm-hmm. There was a second city in Detroit at the time, uh, which is, is now is defunct. But, um, and then I left Detroit and made a move to the second city. I was, I don't know what you would say, promoted, I guess, <laughs> to, to one of the theaters in Chicago. Right. And I performed there for, I performed in Detroit for four years, Chicago two and a half years, and, um, and then was recruited to do, to be on a television show called Mad TV. So yes. that, and there's a, it's a great amalgam of yeah. comedy and live performance uh, coming together in a, in a scenic fashion. And so uh-huh. it was a perfect fit to be at the second city. Well, and, and it sounds like starting in improv, but then maybe ending up it more in sketch. Does one precede the other? Um, boy, that's a good, that's a really good chicken and egg question. Mm. It, 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 one can write sketch. Hmm. How do I, how do I answer that question? There are, there are two different roads. One would say a person, a playwright or a screenwriter is simply a person who's improvising with themselves. Ooh. I had a producer okay. say that to me one time, and I was like, well, that's a good one. I said, I don't know if I want to write. I kind of just like writing through improvisation. And he, and he said to me, well, writing is just improvising with yourself. And I went, okay, that's interesting. So the sketch writer or the 
single cam sitcom writer or the multi cam sitcom writer or the, 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 the uproarious two act comedy play or the farce writer, they're writing in forms, they're writing inside of frames, uh, mm-hmm. particular frames. Um, but they're still, they're still saying, and then I say this, and then I would react like this. And then I would say that, and then he would react to this and then she would react to that. So you are ostensibly, uh, there, there is no clear cut answer for the question. You know, because then other people start to improvise like we did at the Second City Mm -hmm. and we just recorded everything we did. And then you would nip and tuck and polish. Uh, That's how we that's how we create a sketch. sketch. That's how we created content for the Second City. That's actually blowing my mind. This idea that (laughs) improvising with yourself is basically playwriting or Mm -hmm. any more long form. I suppose it could be sketch writing on your own, but your guys' sketch writing was a lot more teamwork oriented and cohesive. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Wow. Because I've always thought of improv training as helping actors, certainly helping you react, helping you work with other people, helping you stay on your toes. But why not just like convert all of that inward to spur yourself into a creative place and just write and write and write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I had never, I had never thought of it that way until that teacher told me that wow. pro- he was a producer and a teacher at the second city of Detroit. And I thought it was a very invaluable piece of information. Mm-hmm. So. And is mad TV. So, but mad TV feels to me like a fair amount of improv went into creating those sketches, right? <clears throat> yes. I, I would say uh, it depended on the type of sketch for a sketch like a character based sketch that has strong oh. character to it. It's mm-hmm. easier to improvise, especially if you've done it several times. Yeah. So if you can improvise in character, very often uh, the co-writer of the sketch is ostensibly a recorder. They're recording the inexperience or sometimes very often Jack, a performance in their office in front of them. Wow. Okay. I'll, in a conceptual sketch, where the comedic game of the sketch is is the uh, is is the is the star, you would mm-hmm. you would want to kind of sit down and, and map it out for yourselves. Now, sometimes organically that comes to you, um, mm-hmm. your life experiences and somebody else's life experiences they mesh, and you find that the organically the comedic game comes forth. Ooh. So th- those are two different types of sketches. Is that there? For me, there's kind of three or four different types. There's mm-hmm. there's the character sketch where where most of the comedy is deriving from the behavior and the belief system or value system of the character. Mm. Um, What makes them tick? What, what are they afraid of? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? The second is what I just mentioned, which is um, a high concept, or as we say in the improv, in the sketch community, heavy game. Does a sketch have heavy game? So, um, uh, and then uh, a third sketch is what Jordan Peele and I would call a peas in a pod sketch, which is usually based a lot mm-hmm. on excitement, excitement and reference. So, so those are kind of the, the, to me, those are the three kind of benchmark pieces of sketch mm-hmm. comedy or any kind of comedy for that matter falls under some one of those categories or some sub subcategory therein. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that process of sort of deciding what is the star of the Sketch, what is the star the of the sketch? Is the is yeah. the is are the machinations the star? Is the mm. situation the star? So a situation right. comedy, you'll you'll uh, somebody else pointed this out to me. You'll notice in a situation comedy, I was on a, a sitcom in two thousand nine called Gary Unmarried, and the showrunner, the creative head of the of the team, the writing team, um, had shared with me. He said the first season of a show is always the most challenging because you have to craft and write hard jokes with Uh, great setups and hard turns so that the audience is laughing at the craftsmanship of the jokes. Why Jack? Because we don't know who the characters are yet. Right. Right. By the time you get to the middle of the second season, the third season, the fourth season, all you have to do is write the situations. The actions will make the situations funny. Mm-hmm. Because that's the context. Now, that's the all you need to do is write the context. So you okay. could, look, I could give you a, a a piece of dialogue from Will and Grace, and if yes. you and I acted it out, you and I could act it as a drama. But once okay. you get to Karen and Jack, as uh-huh. portrayed by Megan Mullally and Sean Hayes, the comedy blossoms. Right. In right. season in season four. 
in season three because we yeah. they've now found those characters. It's it's the syntax with which they say the line, the rhythm, yeah, reflection, the rhythms. That's now what we're laughing at, mm-hmm. and the, the writer now is plugging in uh, a situation that that where we will we we will delight in how those characters deal mm-hmm. with the situation. Does that totally. make sense? Totally. Yeah. It also just explains why TV, especially TV comedy, is so difficult to remain, to stick around. That first season is really difficult to, like, pull off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to have everything fall in line. Yeah. It has to fall in line conceptually. You have to start to already have a great idea or sketch, a, a very promising sketch of who the characters will be. Yeah. And, and hope that they catch on in the zeitgeist. And, and, and also just, like, just smart whip writing. Mm-hmm. And if you can get that amalgam, you're, you, you, you have a real good chance of being successful. Totally. I'm fascinated more and more by the differences between TV and film, especially with, like, this lockdown halting production. I don't know. I've just been thinking more about, like, everyone right now is developing <laughs> their ideas. There's a lot of pre-production going on right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I imagine at some point when the floodgates open, we'll all just be in production a lot. I think so. I really think so. I mean, obviously, p- people want to work for, before any other reason, probably commerce. But <laughs> sure. But, uh, but there is, there is, um, I'm also fascinated by what we were talking about earlier about the culture that's been foisted upon us, yeah. is how this will affect our culture. Um, there's a term that people use in television uh, called, uh, uh, in television, it's called a bottle episode. Yes. And, and, you know, and in a film, it's called a block movie. And I'm wondering if people are going to subconsciously start writing bottle episodes and block movies where everything takes place in this room Mm or everything takes place in this house or, as they used to say, on the block. The whole movie takes place on the block Mm -hmm. Um, or it's uh, writing what, you know, it's right. Yeah. And what we know right now, which is right on top of us, it's 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 um, it's permeating every part of our lives is that we're we're stuck in small, singular places. Or will there be a complete rebellion against it? And will people, will we be splashing everything all over the place? Now that would, that would mean that people have to still be making money. We'd have to have the money to spend on productions of that size. And my understanding is that it's not moving in that direction presently. (laughs) Yeah. Like huge TBD, like it super remains to be seen. My hope would be that the frugality of I think as we come out of this, people will be exercising a certain amount of frugality. Yes. And I think what that does is necessity is the mother of invention. It will create very, very clever content would be my totally. hope. Yeah. Well, and maybe even like sketch, there's probably a lot of sketch comedy to be mined out of this, out of this strange time we're living in. I agree. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Because there's new, there's a new, uh, normal, that's being established. And yeah. once it's established, we can start poking at it. Also, another thing that breeds creativity is boredom. Oh, idleness. Completely. Idleness. And, and so the hopefulness is that I think sometimes um, we find ourselves in um, feedback loops, even in our mm-hmm. entertainment, because everybody's saturating their brains at all times with stimulus. Stimulus, yes. stimulus, stimulus. You, sometimes I think you just need to <laughs> just just be bored J- and just do like sure. a technological detox every now and again and go, you know what I never occurred to me was blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. It's funny. You know, it's interesting, Jack. You don't – I don't see comics, stand-up comics anymore that are very much like Stephen Wright. I feel okay. like Stephen Wright must have enjoyed a glorious amount of, uh, of boredom that allowed him to be creative the way he was creative. Right. Like you'd have to think and be contemplative to think of things the way he did. And, um, mm. and still does. I mean, he's, he, he's still with us, <laughs> um, but uh, it's, you know what I mean? I, I, I kind of, yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of, when the floodgates open, what we start creating. Totally. Uh, yeah. And I guess it's like too soon to tell, but like, is your, are you finding that you're, first of all, is boredom fueling it, but like, is your creative process to the extent that you had like a creative process for creating work before all this, has it, has it changed now? Hmm. I I guess I'm still, I don't know how to answer the question because I think I'm still in the process of it. I would say, I would say, um, 
I'm trying to figure that out because I'm such a, um, as the old adage goes, uh, especially being an improvisational performer, I'm, uh, the old adage is, uh, I'm not an actor, I'm a reactor. Okay. And so, so not having others to react on or uh, yeah. off of, or if you do the, <laughs> there's a little bit of a timing lag <laughs> you know, because, um, because you're doing it over, <laughs> over Skype or Zoom. Yes. Or it's really interesting. Um, because that exists, <laughs> that has not in the past been my bread and butter. Right. My bread and butter has been to be able to create with a person in the moment. And that's why, uh, it, which makes the, uh, which makes the theater even more delicious because you're trying to recreate these moments as if it's the first time. Yes. And the funny thing is when you've spent, you, you've had a really, a very consistent diet of it actually happening for the first time, creating the <laughs> environment, the relationship, the character, uh, uh, um, attributes in a moment instantaneously right. with another person is, is such a rush. And then to tr- and the, the, the great challenge of trying to, at the very least, have the illusion of it looking like that when you're in, um, uh, in a theatrical setting, uh, yeah. you know, a setting with text that you have to learn and perform day after day after day. It's a, a challenge I've always relished. But at, see, you see how I'm completely avoiding your question? Um, <laughs> I, it's too soon to tell. I mean, it is. It really is too yeah. soon to tell. I, I think um, my wife and I were working on a project the other day, and she came up with a really great idea. My, and my wife's my wife's quite brilliant, and she came up with an idea of something that we could do that would be helpful for other people. But this, and then every as we we're talking, my brain keeps going to that default, which is, you know, what is something I could do with somebody? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, I could, oh, this uh-huh. no, has to do with somebody else. And, and her brain is very malleable and has already kind of shifted paradigms. <laughs> and I think I'm still in the process of shifting. Yes, totally. Well, and I'm, but it's still interesting to think about, I hadn't quite thought of sketch to bring it back to this idea of like, if you're improvising and improvising, improvising to create a sketch, that sketch character then comes back. I hadn't made the connection between sketch and theater in that way, where it is all about creating something in the moment, or at least uh, replicating as if it's happening in the same moment, even though you're reading lines on a page. So yeah, like, yeah I'm going. fascinated by that, the writing versus the performing process. Well, the, the, the advantages, the, 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 so there's advantages, there are distinct advantages to two of them, right? And, and, the, and the second city lives in the middle. Improvisation is right. creating a play or doing instantaneous playwriting, right? It's it's creating a moment, creating relationships, creating an mm-hmm. environment, creating a conflict instantaneously. And then it, yeah. and then it's ethereal. It, it, it's it's a, it's Never a see it again. It vanishes. Yeah. Theater is something that you're recre you're, you're you're trying to build in reactions to behavior. The ideal in theater is that one would know the material in their marrow. So that every night you're picking up on the nuances of the other performers in such a way that you're not that that it you are having organic, instantaneous, brand new experiences in the moment, and these words are just going blah 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 blah, and coming out of your mouth. That's the ideal. Mm -hmm. In the middle is the second city. It's very interesting, Jack, because we use improv as a tool to create the sketches and create the programs. Yes. Then sometimes a second city show will run for nine months. Right. <laughs> so you're, so then you're, now you're doing theater. The difference is you, rem, you might remember the first time you had that reaction when you made it up the first time and the, the replication may leave you unsatisfied. Th- th- there have been, right. you know, I, I, I am guilty. There have been many a times where directors come back after we've done a show, we've opened a show at the second city and it's been like a hundred, 110 minutes long. And the director comes back four months later to watch the show and look up backstage and go, so guys, our running time on opening night was uh, 89 minutes. Our running time tonight <laughs> was two hours in one minute. <laughs> Whoa. You got, because you start you, you, the challenge is don't get bored mm. with the material. Try to find small nuances. I know that you created the material that felt very fresh and new when you did it the first time and the first month and the first 90 days. Mm. Now that you've moved past that, now there's a brand new challenge, yeah. which is 
where's the where's the where's the a, a change of inflection here or what if i just played the whole thing tonight as a guy who has a rash on his back what if i played <laughs> the whole thing tonight as someone who um just got out of the dentist chair and and the novocaine's just wearing off <laughs> same performance you know same word so that you can yeah. trick yourself or you know some i've done this in the past write yourself a note and say i'm going to write a different note tomorrow so when I open okay. the drawer and pull the note out, it's going to say something different. Now, in the theater, you can do that with actual props. But I'm saying, Jack, actually do it with fake props that you're binding when you're doing oh gosh. an improv scene. Amazing. So, so that or a scene that was, that was um, born of improvisation but is yes. now a set piece that exists in this, in this program. Totally. And how magical – like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, like, nerding out right now. Um, it's magical, the idea of, like, a character that – gets put into a sketch show that's, you know, 80 minutes long or whatever, but that that character could have been formed out of a completely spontaneous, organic moment of like, oh, I'm going to create this character on the spot in this improv setting. And, and what's interesting, and here's something else that, that, that maybe you'll find, that I find delightful, but maybe you'll find at the very least interesting, is that it, it, I would say in one of your purest, most intuitive moments in improvisation, you're actually being given your character by the other performer, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is what you ultimately is the kind of rapport you ultimately want to have with an acting partner in any scenario, yes, in right. any genre, is that you you did that, which made me react this way. Now, I'm yes. going to do this and try to make you react in a certain way. But what the best days are those days when it just starts flowing and flowing and flowing. Yeah. That you're, when you feel dispossessed, you feel out of control and that there's just two wow. channels communicating with each other and your body happens to be a vessel right. for whatever's coming through. It's when you're so intuitive with the other person and that you're just connecting with them because I'm just hanging on your every word. There yeah. was um, a great exercise. I used to teach improv and one of the greatest exercises, which I think people can use in life, is we'd call it uh, uh, the last last three words, because I find mm-hmm. that very often in life, as we're talking, we're not actively listening. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is I'm not waiting to hear your complete thought. I'm just waiting for you to finish so I can speak. <laughs> and so we used to do this exercise where you'd say a line in an improv scene and the other player had to start their sentence, the next sentence in the scene, with the last three words of your gotcha. line mm-hmm. so that everyone's present. So sometimes that birth, that birth of a character, is coming from your complete and utter point of concentration being the other performer. Yeah, yeah. Total listening, yeah. Total, yeah, actually, that's a good way, but holistic listening. Total Ooh. listening. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, and this just explains so much about your 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 process. Like you're saying, it's difficult over over Skype or over Zoom to have those kind of like pinpoint. In I think eye contact is just like mm-hmm. a super important tool. Mm-hmm. And also, this just explains like you. So you had that connection with Jordan Peele, and you found that. I don't know. Did you find that from day one with him? I did. I did. When yeah. I met him, I found it from day one when I met him. I met him in um, I met him in two thousand and three or 2002, right around there. I can't remember. Um, but we, uh, he was performing at a, a, an improv sketch theater in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And they had tra- traveled to the States to perform at second city, like uh, on a very limited, a very, very limited, limited tour. <laughs> our, our main mm-hmm. stage cast from second city went to the Netherlands and they came this way. And Seth uh, Myers was involved. At, Seth at Myers. Yep. Yes. He was, he was a member of a boom Chicago. It's called. And oh, cool. Seth, Seth Myers and uh, Jordan both were members of Boom Chicago. So part of our big sketch family. And mm-hmm. we met. And so Jordan had bus tables and worked as a bar back at the Second City in Chicago mm-hmm. and was taking writing classes at the Second City in Chicago when Tina Fey and Rachel Dratch and Scott Atsit and all those guys were on stage. So all the people that were in 30 Rock when mm-hmm. they were on Second, at Second City before they went to SNL. Right. And so he and I had – we shared similar nomenclature – similar ideas uh, uh, and understandings of the concepts of, of uh, you've heard the term yes anding, y- y- yes anding mm-hmm. each other, you know, uh, sure. um, taking someone's information and adding to it or enhancing it. Mm-hmm. And so it was a match made in heaven. We met, we saw each other perform. And I remember one night we spent, we spent the whole night in a diner with a bunch of friends, like six of us at a diner on Clark, the Clark Street Diner, right off of the red line <laughs> in Chicago until like five in the morning. I'm like, I'm in love. 
I'm in comedy. Love. I'm in love. I had yes. no idea. It was ser- completely serendipitous that we ended up working together. Um, okay. At, at the set, at, at, on Mad TV and writing sketches together. And Jordan Peele, he may be one of the greatest practitioners of of what I call tri level scenic work. He knows how okay. to to layer games on top of games. So sometimes it's by character, sometimes it's inferring character. So it's funny because I feel like giving giving an example of a sketch is 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 probably the best way to do it, mm-hmm. which which is that. So he did a sketch one time with a, a woman. It was just a sketch with him and this woman. I wasn't in it. He comes home and his wife is asking him why she has to um, she has to handle the cookies because she, she 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 was trying to get onto a a web page, but all the cookies had been cleared. And uh-huh. and, right, and and he was like, huh, that's strange. And she goes, yeah, I don't know. I can't figure out why. I'm trying to do com- command. Oh, control here, but I did, it's just weird that it would just, uh, and he's like, huh, interesting. She goes, were, were you on the computer um, today? He goes, no, no, not today. And as you see, as you see him mentioning, he starts sweating. He starts sweating. Uh-huh. And then, and so, so, so the first game is there's a mystery to the scene. Now right. you and I are already on board that he's been watching illicit material on the computer and then he clears right. the cook. She can't see it. Right. So the good thing is there's two people involved already, the audience and Jordan's character. The wife doesn't know what's going on. Mm, okay. So that's game number one. Is she going to figure it out? And when she does, what's she going to do? Game number two is that we rigged this thing in Jordan's hair, these tiny little um, little straws that were like faucets. Oh. So he's just he's, so we could control how much he was sweating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they keep cutting back to her, and she's befuddled, and she's trying to figure out how to, why, why the cookies are gone. And you cut back to him, and eventually he's sweating more. Then he's sweating copiously, Jack. And then eventually... Yes literally water spouting straight up in the air out of his head and he's just drenched. And and then she, she finally figures out what's happening and asks him if he's been watching porn. And he says, yes. So you see there's the, the, the mystery is one game. Mm-hmm. How much sweat can come out of this man is another game. And then when right. she finds out what's going to happen, we, the audience go, how is she going to lower the boom on him? And and she decides that she does understand, and I can't remember. Actually, isn't it funny? I can't remember the the um, button of the scene. But, but, there's but a, it, there has to be a button. There's yeah. always a button. Yeah, and the button is something about how she admits, uh, she confesses that she was uh, looking at porn someplace else. Or something, you know what I mean? So that he yeah. had nothing to me about or to uh, subvert. Yeah, to, to subvert to subvert what we're, what what our expectation is. Yes, and right. Jordan is such an amazing practitioner of that. That uh, of of understanding in the moment that the kernel of a scene can give birth to three different levels. Some scenes are extremely linear and some scenes have these kind of peaks and valleys. Tri level. What, what was it? Tri level scenic work or, or layered or, or, or tri layered scenic work like Jordan's mind in a comedic sense. And I would say also in, in, in the horror genre as well, Jordan mm-hmm. is always trying to stack at least three games Right, 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 right. What we call games. He's trying to stack three games at a time. So if you think about a sketch that you've seen on Saturday Night Live or Key and Peele or Chappelle Show or Mad TV or Upright Citizens Brigade or uh, uh, League of Gentlemen, any of these kinds of shows, the framing is always different. But what's fascinating right. is what is the star in the scene? Right. Is, the who, is the who the star? Is uh, the conflict the star or is the environment the star? So cool. Yeah. That's so cool. This is like this. It's really is the science. It's the science of comedy. I love the science of it. I, yeah. I mean, and there, there are rules that seem arbitrary, but people have been following the same rules and, 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 right. and repackaging and renaming them for themselves for thousands of years since Aristophanes. So someone like Tina yeah. Fey and Robert Carlock, who did Kimmy Schmidt and 30 Rock, yeah. part of the, the, the love, the game, that one of the internal games of the, uh, uh, it's in the DNA of, of 30 Rock, is there's a titillation that you feel and an, uh, like a, a kind of delicious anxiety is that you don't <laughs> know when the next joke is coming. Because Robert and Tina on purpose made sure that they wanted to have a joke come like every five seconds. So many jokes. Yeah. So many jokes. A pop, 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 pop. Totally. And then in that environment, it's great because once you get to know the characters like Kenneth, the intern, right. The sitcom you, thing, right. You go back to the sitcom thing and you start yeah. nailing joke, joke after joke after joke, or the old police squad movies and police squad TV show, uh, police squad was the show naked gun were the movies with Leslie mm-hmm. Nielsen. I know we're laughing at the gags, 
But part of the enjoyment is not knowing when the next gag is coming. Yeah. Okay. And trying to anticipate it. Yeah. And this is all very conscious. It's not like, oh, we, we accidentally included this many jokes. Like you are setting out to create that leveled One, structure. This is game on top of game. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Game, layered top game, game layered on top of game, layered on top of game, layered on top of game. So that people are getting multifaceted enjoyment. And in order to practice, I mean, that is just a skill, right? That's just that you got to do the training and you got to yeah. follow your own path. And like yeah. for someone on your path, it helps to have the theater background to combine with the improv and, and the writing. What I try to always, uh, what I always try to plug in, I plug in the character work. I'm trying to think of where's the character coming from. Ooh. So a writer, what, uh, I was on the computer earlier today. This might be the last thing I have to say, cause I'm going to have to wrap up with you here, but I could talk yes, for yes, a yes. million years. Me too. Uh, yeah. Um, my wife and I were watching something and she, cause my wife's a writer and a director. So she sees things differently than I see things. And a good example of it that just came up today is we were watching a masterclass ad as it, it was yes. an advertisement before a YouTube video we were watching. And it had Margaret Atwood, the author and mm-hmm. Margaret Atwood said, she said, you take an old story like um, little red riding hood. And she goes, but if you put a twist on it, like the beginning of the story goes, she couldn't see deep inside the wolf's belly. Ooh, uh-huh. If that's where the thoughts Margaret Atwood, right? That's the kind of thing my wife would do is that she thinks mm-hmm. from that angle. Mm-hmm. What I'm thinking about is how, how terribly horrified I am at how dark it is in the wolf's inside. belly. Inside. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from, I'm thinking of it from the character's <laughs> emotional state. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And then how you would react to your co-stars or how you would bounce off somebody else in the wolf's belly. Yes, yeah, exactly. Or in this, in this case, uh, his intestinal lining. <laughs> or whatever. Yes, if that's a character. Yeah. If that's a and character. And then you imbue that and make that a character. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Keegan, thank you. This is awesome. I really was hoping to get like this real like pure gold of the science of, of comedy and like we're only scratching the surface here, but... Yeah. Thank you for thank you for this gl- like glimpse inside your process. Do you have like three more minutes to answer some very backstagey questions? Yes, I can do that for three minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. First of all, how did you get your SAG card? Do you remember? I it was a commercial that I made in Detroit oh. for um, a local. It was for a local. Oh God, what was the product that you made? No, I didn't make it. I was just an actor in it. I was oh, okay. just an actor, but I, I was Taft Hartley before that commercial. And then I made, I made this commercial where I was sitting with a bunch of other guys. It was, it, it was something for sports in Detroit. It was either a sporting goods store or like the local ticket master affiliate for buying sports tickets for sports events. Something like that. that's how I got my okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's always the most random gig. Of course. Yeah. It's always, always. Yeah. Um, what is one performance that every actor should see and why? Every actor should see. This is the hard one. This is the hard one. Yeah. Um, I have other actors said to you, I have two performances, but no. Um, <laughs> yes. W- one performance I think everyone should see, especially I'm, you're, you're talking to a person who has an extensive, you know, has an extensive background in improvisation. Mm. One performance everybody should see is Jenna Rowland's in Woman Under the Influence. Oh, uh-huh. uh-huh. It's, 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 it's an otherworldly performance. It yeah. really is an otherworldly performance. And, um, you can't imagine that that person, that regular human being is that it's one of those where you get lost and go, I can't imagine that she's okay. <laughs> yeah. I imagine that in real life, she's okay. And, and then in real life, wow. you would find out that she's, that she's quite all right. You, you, you know, that it, it's, it's because I would say it's Jenna Rowland's performance, but t- to harken back to what we mentioned before, so much of that performance comes from Peter Falk. Yes. It comes from Peter. Total Falk. reacting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's reacting and being in that space with him. It's mm-hmm. almost like a, this is an oxymoron, but it's like being inside of a safe maelstrom. Ooh. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so that I, I said, that's one performance mm-hmm. everyone should see. A safe maelstrom. Yes. This is blowing my mind. Um, okay, last question. What is one piece of advice you would give your younger self if you could go back in time? Something you wish you'd known. That I wish I'd known. I wish I wish I had known. <laughs> I wish I had known when I was younger that everybody is. Uh, <laughs> this is an actor speaking here. Uh, that not, everyone's not thinking about you. Just figure out how to help solve the problem. That's it. 
All anybody here is thinking about is how do we make the project the best thing it can be? That's what everyone's thinking about. Don't, don't worry about you were, you do you mm-hmm. and, and, and part of you should be solving the, how do I help make this the best project possible? Mm-hmm. I wanted to know that a, a little sooner. <laughs> I would have liked sure. to know that sooner, you know, because That's fundamentally it is a, it's like, it's a problem or it's like, it's a mystery to it's solve. A puzzle. It's a puzzle a to puzzle. be solved. Yeah. yeah it's cool. A puzzle to be solved. If, uh, as my wife would say, if there's a question, it only exists because the answer is there. Whoa. Yeah. Questions don't exist unless an answer is there. And, um, actually can we, let's make it that Jack. I wish I could have <laughs> my younger self. A question only exists because the answer is already there. Right. So find the answer yeah. as your, as your task. As a make, that, make that your raison d'etre is, yes. is, is to find the answer to solve the puzzle. Oh my God. Keegan, this is amazing. Thank you. This was a blast. Thank you this so much. Everything I could have hoped for and more. Um, considering we are not in the same room, I really think this was, the, we, we are connecting in person as, as if it's in person. This is great. Yes. <laughs> from, uh, auditorily. Yes. yes, yes. From, from, yes. An, from an oral perspective. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, gosh, thank you so much. Um, my pleasure, Jack. Thank you. This was so great. Have a good rest of your day and hang in there. I will. You too. Happy quarantine. Happy quarantine. Stay (laughs) safe. Stay sane. I will. You too. You too. Take care, Jack. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.